What's up guys, today we're gonna be doing something completely new. I have something really cool that I'm really, really excited about and no kidding because I got coached by one of the best players in the world, Mr. Ben CB, the founder, the creator, the head coach of Razor Edge. I love Ben, I love his approach to poker. He has a very much, I wanna play the most mathematical against regulars and I wanna play the most crazy as I could in possible situations against recreationals, which makes for a really awesome poker style. Um, I'm pretty much opening myself up here. I get coaching. This guy is just going to look at my hands. He's just going to, you know, cut me in half, going to look at the insides and say what I'm doing wrong. Um, I hope that it teaches you guys something about how professionals study, how professionals learn and how useful coaching can be. And also teaches you something about Raise Your Edge because I fucking love that site. And um, yeah, enjoy. Here we go. Okay, guys, we're here with the legend Ben CB. Uh, I've been talking a lot about Razor Edge on the stream. I've also been talking a lot about Razor Edge on YouTube. Um, I had a really deep run and we had some interesting spots, especially when we got near the final table later on in the tournament. Um, and I kept talking and asking myself, what would Ben CB do in this spot? So who better than to ask the man himself? What's up, Ben? How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm really looking forward to go through some of your hands and uh, yeah, I'm really curious how you go, how you tackle different spots. Yeah. So there's uh, th this is the thing with coaching guys. Like if, if somebody, um, if you ask somebody for coaching and you're looking like for right now, I'm really curious about stuff like ICM and those spots, but there's going to be so many spots that I didn't think we would be talking about. And that's the beauty of coaching and finding out and looking at different information and angles of your game. So I'm really curious to see what we find out too. I'm completely, uh, opening myself up i just uh i just want to improve um there's nothing when the, it's like no holds barred i just want to improve and see what's out there ben is uh, one of the best coaches there is in the world so grateful for the opportunity and let's get going all right then let's dive into it um we're going to make it without a hat because i think you play without a hat anyway right yeah. so let's do it without a hat without a hat and uh, see how it goes uh, we're going to skip the most obvious hands the, fir the first hand i find personally very interesting is, is pocket fives here is that a standard open race for you yes um it's it's a very close one uh usually i would start opening six to sevens here as default um okay. because pocket fives especially with the stack size around 30 35 25 big blinds where people can still flat call a lot you're just going to check fold so many uh flops and you also can't really see bad um you also open lower pairs or is fives the bottom of your range here uh fives really is the bottom yeah um that's definitely still okay if you would have opened four three deuces i would say you're gonna lose money in the long run even though if you have weak opponents it's just not gonna uh, win enough money. Uh, you just have to give up too many flops turns. It's as you know with the, those pairs. If you don't hit a set, just really hard to to barrel, to pick up equity. So with this deck set, we will start moving towards like ten nine suited, jack nine suited, even king nine, queen nine suited. Those hands perform much better with its deck size. Oh, interesting. Um, that, that's yeah. interesting because I would fold queen nine suited here. Yeah, no, queen nine suited is much better okay yeah especially from these positions because you're not going to get flatted by queen jack off queen 10 off uh or king 10 off so hands that have very high equity it's only those suited combinations that are flatting you and since suited combinations are always less you're going to be in those spots less often and you also block uh those hands that are going to flat call you also three bit against you with pocket fives you don't do either of these and they also have really poor playability with 100 big blinds totally fine even deuces i'm opening here oh, okay. uh, yeah queen eight suited guess this is pretty standard uh, right this is like I, I i've been making this old school series on youtube and i'm really worried whenever i press like next move to see what <laughs> i did i, I checked so it out but it's now. It's great. It's, like, it's great. I, I mean, I, you the guy opened and you like waited. I was like, I'm gonna defend here. Am I not? Like, obviously, I know. <laughs> Please do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I watched your your stuff 
and it's great man it's great i think it just shows you uh how dedicated you are towards poker and you don't care about you know pulling up old hands and showing everyone how many hands you have misplaced misplayed in your career <laughs> and uh Thanks, it's just dude. yeah it's just awesome uh so so winning checks um would you also consider regemming as a default preflop here for 20 oh, okay. bigs? Oh yeah, okay. Would you would you consider that? Um I usually try to uh jam like some stuff for value and some stuff that has like a little bit less playability than queen 8. I still think that people open quite light sometimes from the small blind. Uh like a lot of hands that they, you know, probably should be limping. So I think that queen 8 still dominates some hands that he raises. So <clears throat> like i'm kind of wasting the playability of this hand and then i would much rather shove like queen five um you should reverse it in in poker and i always see it as investing in stocks you right you want to invest into stocks in high equity opportunities and and what people often do is the the way you just said it um i just call because it plays better it has a better playability but we want a three bet uh, we want to re-raise, we want to bet with hands that have relatively high equity. And also you want to go all in with hands. So if you if you really have to make the decision between queen eight suited and queen five suited, you should go for queen eight suited. Okay. Um, and, and the same also applies for three betting small blind versus button. If you want to choose king queen suited over king queen off, you should always three bet king queen suited. If you pick your bluffs, you should always pick the best equity bluffs. Right. Of course, we also want to have a flooding range. And I think it's it's one of the biggest misconceptions right now that people. But and I'm very certain you're not doing it. Uh, if I check out your streams, you play very exploitative. And I think that's also why we come along so well is that people like they completely misunderstand that it's about balancing your range with strong hands. No, it's actually not true. You don't need to have strong hands in your checking range or in your small betting range. Um, when when you do dive a little bit deeper into GTO and Pyro Solver, you you will see that very often it wants to bet big with strong hands and wants to raise go very straight for value. Actually, it is this good old poker which we used to play five, six, seven, eight years ago, where you have a good hand, you bet big, and yeah. this is something people in these days have. I don't know if mislearn is the right word here or the right term. And they're reversing it and they always want to have strong hands in their in their checking range in order to to be balanced but gto is not about being balanced gto is about maximizing your own ev and it's about then of course here and there calling down the right amount of hands that means also sometimes calling down with weak top pairs second pairs but then of course also being able to to find out or let's say to estimate the situation properly whether your opponent is capable of having enough bluffs that's why I always advise people, you guys, just overfold and you're always going to be on the uh, safe side in, in, in many, many spots. Um, so just that as a side note, because I think it's, it's very important. It goes for so many spots where people, oh, I want to check back this good draw because it plays so nice on later streets and I don't want to get raised. And, you know, people always want to put themselves in uncomfortable situations instead of, you know, going s straight for value. So... That, that, is, that is an interesting point you make because one of the reasons why I really uh, like this is like six, seven years ago, why I started hating Holdem is because um, when people started thinking about GTO, like the first adjustment that they made was just to check back everything that was <clears throat> like reasonably vulnerable. But even like, you know, a King Jack on Jack five deuce or something, they'd be like, well, you know, somebody check raise and barrel. like, and it became so boring every pot was so small and i think that also just shows that it was like such a misadjustment to yeah. what they were studying yeah and this definitely belongs to my top three list of what separates a very very successful high stakes player from a not so experienced player yet is that he is going thin for value in many many spots whereas a lesser experienced player player is yeah more afraid to go thin for value on any street and if you check some of the YouTube footage that is always uploaded from the poker stars replays, right, uh, from scoops and W coops, and you see all those great players, you can see like in many spots they go very thin for value. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. All right. What do you What do you think about betting here in the flop? Um, I would like if I have like here I just kind of in these spots I try to look at like future street playability. Yeah. Whereas I have 
I have so many backdoors with this hand that I can call a lot of bets on the turn. Um, I can also still, you know, delay bets some some uh, some lower combinations. Um, I feel like if I have a hand like Queen Eight Offsuit here, then I probably stab a lot. Stab yeah, twice probably. But uh, I think with Queen Eight Suit, I check a lot. Yeah. Um... Same spiel here. Queen Eight Suited just has way more equity against the calling range. Like I always approach it. Okay, how many equity do I have if he calls? Right. And yeah. Queen Eight Suited with the back to flush draw has more equity than Queen Eight Off. If you, the thing is though, what I like about what you just said is about protecting your equity because this then actually this is the exceptional situation when we play around twenty big blinds. You want to take more care of equity protection. So that means. Bad folding queen eight suited might be not a disaster, but would be a disaster um, if, if let's say the flop is jack nine five. Then we have a higher incentive to to check it back, because okay. that's that's always a going rule of short stack poker. If you have a draw and you can't stack off, check back, because now the likelihood of getting raised becomes much higher. Right? They can check jam any top pair, check jam, queen 10, king queen, over pairs, which they can't for 100 big blinds. And if they race, we can still float once with queen eight and the nut gut shot or a second nut gut shot and then an over card. Um, but you can't with 20, 25 big blinds. And this is for, that helped me for solving short stack poker when I know I have a draw and I can't stand, stand the race. Even though if he raises once, he can jam the turn because the stack to pot ratio is so small. So then yeah. I just check back. And I bet my strongest draws. And then you start betting nut flush draws, king high flush draws, where you then also dominate uh, your opponent's draws in case he's playing a draw aggressively. But if you have, let's say, here's a flush draw, right? Jack, four, deuce, and you have jack and spades, four and spades, and you have something like seven, seven, six and spades, you just have to check back. Because you're just... Do you think that Hmm? Do you think that you ever get check raised by like random check raise? Or maybe with this stack depth you don't, but... Just like, in my in my mind, it's such a waste if somebody check raises here and they just like randomly check raise ten nine offsuit because they don't think that they can you know make it happen with a C bet, but with a check raise they could. Um, I actually really like it, but it's more as an exploitive play because people started stabbing a lot of pairs. Like if they have king deuce, they stab once, four or five, they stop once, but in order to protect their hands. But actually, the problem is. You over start overdoing it if you start stabbing everything because you get vulnerable against check raises. And you still have five outs against over pairs. You still have five outs against, let's say, a hand like ace jack. Um, and you get blown off your equity in case your opponent has a draw. And by checking back, you're always going to see a river as well because you're going to call most turns anyway. And that is our goal very often with 20 25 big blinds. Um, actually, that's why I would like people see more often check raising as a bluff, blind versus blind, because the stabbing frequencies for my, this is something where I don't have the data. It's just based on my uh, observations, in-game observation, observations. I mean, there's a stat you can, stats you can use, but this is not part of this video. But I think, yeah, I actually, like something like 10-9 in, in spades, you can also double bar. If you think your seabed doesn't work, it's just, I think a matter of taste. If, if, if you feel comfortable playing check raise pots, and then you kind of know what your opponent is defending against and you know how to proceed on later streets, go for it. Um, I think both lines are, are reasonably fine. And then you just continue continuing uh, if you pick up equity on the turn. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, let's play it pretty standard. Thinking three, also very standard. That's a very nasty spot. I actually yeah. I can't remember what you what you did here. What would you love to see you doing here? Um, if he's a if that this to me comes kind of down like if he's a if he's a reg I probably flat if he's a fun player I fold. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like this reasoning. I I approach it hundred percent the same. Because a fun player just has, I don't know, 80% of the time Kings plus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kings. Yeah, maybe Queens as well. 
but yeah. even queens i feel like he's sizing up and then it looks like we don't need so much equity but if you put it in a um equilab tool you i mean king jack against aces kings maybe queens occasionally you perform very very poorly um so on your way out of position stack the pot ratio is going to be awkward so yeah against the rack we call I, a rack can easily have king 10 suited you know like ace five suited and then we have a much better equity yeah. i would also call then yeah What would be your what would you jam here? Um, I think nines plus ace queen plus. Yep. I think ace check suited might be borderline. Yeah. Yeah. I would go for the same. Jam or race? Um, I think that's. Um, I think that I can jam this hands because uh, I think this is one of the good hands to just kind of secure the pot with. Um, I think that I can have weaker hands uh, um, like Ace X still to have a race folding range here. I think that um, I like adding in King Jack because it does it plays pretty well in all ins. It doesn't necessarily play like you know fantastic against uh, against blind ranges that defend. Yeah. So you would mainly race forward Ace X hands and jam all these Broadway hands. Um, I think that it's kind of funny when you ask because I do think that I min raise his hands. But I'm trying to, uh, you know, also what about what you said earlier, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to guess what you said, I say I should do, but I'm just trying to kind of learn as I go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that I'm in race it because I kind of feel like uh, as a race folding hand or something, it does fine too, but um, I don't know. Then what you said about protecting your equity, I think that King Jack might fall in that category. Exactly. Um, and... It basically covers both requirements, having good, uh, enough equity against the calling range, plus it needs protection. Like race folding, we probably have to race fold, and yeah. this would be a disaster. And it's a profitable jam, 15 bigs. So I always approach it like this, if, if I can't race call, if it's a vulnerable hand, if it's a profitable jam for me, even if it's 20 bigs, I mean, the, the thing is with 20 bigs, there aren't really any hands that are very profitable jams except aces and kings, even those pairs are kind of okay-ish. But everything above 20 bigs, we should never jam those hands here, simply because the EV is just not high enough. And so there's a certain threshold where you should switch from shoving to, to raising in order to increase the EV, because then just open raising it, investing less in order to, to win the same amount of debt money is going to push your, your EV so much. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah, for, for me, it, it's not about the stack size. It's always about, okay, is it profitable or not? It's the same for river sports, right? If, if I know, okay, going all in five times the pot is extremely profitable here, then we should do it. Yeah. And people always, way yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's about what is very profitable. Of course it, it might be higher variance play, but if I know I'm going to pick up the pot 90% of the time, like that's, that's the same yeah. we do on final tables. We go all in versus a 10 big blind stack. If we have 20 big blind when there is a one big blind stack at the final table with three dudes off suited because we know it's extremely profitable and the guy can't call anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's what I, and I think that is also an important concept that people, you know, if you cannot make that move at for five times spot all in because of the variance, then you shouldn't be playing those buy-ins. Yeah. And you're playing above your bankroll. And also like people sometimes think of it as like a waste of a tournament or a waste of a stack, but that's just not, that's just not how you should look at poker. You should do whatever is the most profitable in your current hand. Yeah. I mean, you know, with ICM considerations, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just designing a little bit here of a, of a range. I mean, it's not going to be exactly 
how would I put it? Because you need to also pull up HSC, see what exactly is the bottom of your jamming range, which is reasonably profitable. But something like this, and uh, probably also some uh, race folding, some of these king 10 off, queen 10 off, jack 10 off, um, probably also jamming king 9, queen 9 suited race folding, some, some of these hands here. I uh, also want to have some suited connectors for bot coverage post flip. So I think that that would be somewhat my range here. And actually, around 28, uh, 28 29% from cutoff for 15 bigs is, is pretty decent. And if we think the blinds are even more passive, we can start adding a few more hands here. Um, maybe some more suited kings. Actually, I would definitely open more suited kings. They're actually extremely strong with that stack size. Um, so uh, yeah. just for clarification, yeah. you would uh, you would uh, shove the red ones, you would race call the green ones, and you would race fold the blue ones. Yes, exactly. Okay. I was just too lazy to add the uh, yeah, just for the viewers, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I don't know. Uh, jam. So then you can we can also check here. We have 178 combos race calling, 116 combos race folding. That's actually a pretty decent ratio. 60-40, 65 35. So, yeah, somewhat like this. I like it. This is already like if I see these hands, this is way looser than I than I play in this position. Like uh, the, the, why the king check offset? Ah, well, the, yeah. The the king six, the king seven suits. There's no way I'm opening those. Jack and offsuit neither. Uh, yeah, those are the borderline again. If you if you play around twenty seven and, and you fold those hands, that's totally reasonable. Like they are very close in terms of EV. But if you want to start considering, uh, you should definitely fold those here. Um, but if you want to add some more hands, then uh, you, those should be the first candidates to add. Okay. Yeah. I uh, actually card remove effects are pretty important here because one, two, three, four, five players have folded in front of you. So that already comes into play because it's more likely that they fold garbage hands than a six or king x hands. Yeah, so, that's what you guys uh, adjusted in your course, right? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. We recently adjusted that for our jamming ranges as well, where we made some that's analysis what how card removal effects affect jamming ranges. And of course, then all our jamming ranges become tighter because if if let's say we're even on the button or small blind, a jam with seven six suited is horrible for seventeen bigs, just because it's much it's so likely that the big blind will have a calling range, a calling hand. And yeah. this is something many, many players completely disregard. <clears throat> awesome. I, I really I really love I really love like when kind of like concepts that you believe were true kind of get kind of like, you know, the foundation of it kind of shakes. And you start thinking about it the whole way and that's that's why i think why coaching and studying is so important because already now i'm feeling like oh my god i can't wait to play again because i want to relearn and rethink so many spots now yeah and for me personally so, that's why i also love doing like user to user coachings i do with other great poker players or just talking about hands like when we talk chat in, in discord about hands um or with other coaches we do we review hands together um, or I also even take coachings from other guys that are really, because I'm not so mathematic, mathematical. So I really sometimes need some help in terms of, you know, making some formulas, equations, if I want to break down a three bit forward spot or four bit jam spot, and I want to do it by hand. Um, it's sometimes, even if it's, you just like, you get confirmed what you believe in and you're like, yeah, you're doing good. It's such a boost for your confidence, for your because sometimes in poker, it's a game of a lack of, like, there's such a lack of information that sometimes we confuse and we overwhelm ourselves so much because we don't know, we don't get the confirmation whether we play the hand right or not, whether yeah. our strategy is good or not. And then just getting the feedback, yeah, everything is all right, keep going. It's, yeah. It just helps you so much. Especially in PLO, that's so important, man. <laughs> oh, fuck PLO, yeah. 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 You play a lot so of PLO? Uh, I played a few million hands. I never really dove deep into the lab. Um, I got a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching from a really good player, Lauti. Okay. But um, I was just S and E grinding. So like, how much do you realistically improve back and then? You know. Yeah. Back then? True. But I I played a lot of PLO. I really enjoy playing it. Yeah, me too. I'm a I'm a I'm a PLO fish, but I love it. I really like 
it's just so <laughs> complex and there's just even though it's pot limit but i feel like you there's just so much shit you can do because yeah. of course you have four cards right <laughs> yeah it's amazing yeah pocket eights um yeah pretty ja uh, pretty standard jam of course also a pretty jam uh what would be the bottom of pairs you would jam here um fours i think 14 the blinds oh yeah i know because i saw you guys post something like i'm I, if i have 11 big blinds from like undergun plus one i'm probably shoving threes and fours and i saw that that i i saw somebody post in the in your guys is uh, discords and and then somebody said the cutoff was much higher than that and then i was like oh my fucking god i'm gonna uh, that's definitely a huge leak of mine yeah um I go with 15 big blinds under the gun with something like sevens and better. And then if I have 12, I add sixes and fives. And really around nine, 10 big blinds, I, let's say I start consider jamming th uh, four seduces. DB is not good. Okay. Um, it's very often just very marginal. And yeah, I with more than 10 big blinds, I try to avoid those very, very marginal jams. Like if I have less than 10 big blinds, I'm also more inclined to take break even spots simply because there are not so many more spots waiting. Um, but there can be quite a difference, a significant dif difference um, when you have 11 or 12 big blinds. Because it's just- when you, yeah. have like, when you have 13 big blinds or something, do you consider shoving pocket threes if you're at a table full of fun players? actually no because the more fun players the more likely it is you will get a high ev spot in in one of the next year orbits oh, okay that makes sense yeah. i just i just kind of sometimes you know i well the one spot that i really really like to take against fun players is shoving small blinds yeah that's that's no that's perfect there are spots it now i'm uh, i'm coming from it depends Small blind uh, versus big blind, where people are supposed to call extremely wide, right? Let's, I'm just gonna um, take that off here, where you very often you have to call like, I don't know, 60% of your hands. And that is very often where fun players are too much focused on their actual hand. And if they if they have, um, let's say, king five off, they're like, ah, oh, fuck, like, it's not a nice hand, I fold. Whereas yeah. it's a snap call, or let's say they have, even 10, nine off against the seven, eight big blind jam. They just toss it. And also it really depends also on their own stack size. I not probably not going to get any loser if they have a 100 big blind stack. I mean, he's just probably laughing and like, okay, 10, nine off, let's gamble or a six, yeah. five suited. Right. And then you're owning yourself. Um, but if he has 20 big, like we can we either cover him or we can damage his stack. Then I'm, always going wider than Nash, like even yeah. even wider than what would be suggested with card removal effects. Um, if you check some of these spots in HRC, they have to call like 50, 60% against seven big blind, eight big blind, which is never going to happen. And uh, yeah, in those spots, but then where they're supposed to call relatively tight. So let's say here in the early positions, they have to fold actually ace jack suited or king queen suited. They're not doing it or pocket sevens because there's so many players left to act and our jamming range is also reasonably strong. So in those spots yeah. where they're supposed to call rather tight, I'm not getting any looser, but in those spots where they are supposed to call very wide, I'm getting extremely loose. Yeah, okay, interesting. Because, yeah, they'll, they'll, like this show, 14 of blinds, there's a lot of fun players will just snap it off with King Queen offsuit. Yeah, exactly. And, and then, even like when you when you 12, 13, 14 big blinds, you just see those King Jack suited, King 10 suited, Ace 9 suited calls too much and too often. And that's why where those low pocket pairs are getting minus EV or Jack 10 suited, 10 9 suited is break even or also slightly minus EV. So now some of you might ask, but well, then what are you, what is the exploit there? There is no exploit. The thing is you're going to make up for those hands you're additionally folding now is that once you have a good hand, let's say you jam ace queen, ace king, jacks tens, your, your EV is higher because when called your equity is higher. That's, yeah. that's the automatic exploit. Okay. It's so funny how like every hand ties into other concepts, other situations, and they're all, it's so important to just like, 
you know, just grasping a small blind concept, you can also reverse it from the big blind. Like, how are you going to do that? Like, you know, that's what yeah. I love about poker. Every time you talk about a situation, you could end up talking about a fucking PLO river spot in the end. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, I'm curious about your calling range here. Like, we don't need to break down the entire calling range, but maybe just, you know, in terms of offsuited kings and offsuited aces. Man, I think offsuited kings is like king jack plus. Like yeah. King 10, maybe. Frankly, I, I wouldn't be so tight, but I think it's better to be as tight as you are, in theory. Yeah. Um, I, I I really started, it's also because you gave me shit on it for Discord when you watched my stream. <laughs> yeah. And then you said I, I defend, and then, you know, you talked about, like, uh, defending weak aces, even heads up, like, weak ace against the under the gun range, because you're not going to realize your equity. Yeah. Um, when you could be good on some boards, people just barrel because they're good players. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, have already, I've never been a fan over the last year and a half. I'd done some, uh, PIO stuff when I had a little bit more time. And then I just started folding hands like King nine, King eight offsuit. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I would, I would fold like ace seven offsuit, all that stuff here easy. Yeah. So I have a pretty tight three way defending range. Yeah. What about the hand like six, five suited? Um, I probably fold that with call like eight nine suited. I think that you need a little bit of high card value there if you play three way. Um, that's no actually six five like these hands perform much better. Also, the the thing with nine eight suited is, and that's the beauty about four five suited. And if you look into um, equity utilization, this is something I've been spending on a lot the past year. Is those hands have a much higher equity utilization than those hands against okay. typical under the gun MP ranges. Why? Because those ranges consists of, again, jacks, tens, queens, ace, 10, ace, nine. So have all these hands and they block our outs heavily. So yeah. we are going to less, especially against two guys. Now it's even more likely that somebody has a jack, two jacks or two tens, or one guy has ace, 10, the other guy has king jack. It's blocking our out so much, and this drops our accusation. Whereas here in that area, four, three, four, five, six, five suited, they're not going to have those cards around sixes and fives so frequently yeah, yeah. as around a ten or a jack. Or even even if they don't block the cards, then you're also going to be put in tough spots because when you do hit something, those are also exactly. more likely to yeah. be barreled. Yeah, and you also automatically have less equity with your draws because they already probably have one of your outs in, in your hand. Um, so this is something you always want to take into consideration. I was just really quick. So we're not only making assumptions. Um, so one second, I'm just going to pull up um, some numbers here because I think it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, yeah. um, so I basically gave under the gun and cut off like the typical flooding range, a typical opening range. It's not really, I like, can be loose. I can be tighter. That's not really the point here. It's about the rough estimation of the ranges. And then we have King nine off. So, because people might say, well, Ben and Lex, we just need 15%. Like, are we going to win the pot every uh, 6.5 time? isn't that often enough in order to justify the call. So you see, we already have 24% raw equity. And now this is something you have to believe me. Actually, no, wait, we can also put this up. Uh, so if you just check, I, I only have that for heads up pots. Um, so if you check the equity utilization with King nine off, you're just going to realize 60% of your equity. A multi-way pot, of course, course, it drops, right? Let's say if we if we hit a gut shot and it goes bad, bad, we have to fold, whereas we would call in a heads up pot. So very often yeah. we, are, we have to give up post flop in spots where we would continue in heads up pots. So let's assume 50% and we're only going to real, we, so our real equity is 12%. And every single time you call a king nine off, you're losing money. That's uh, so let's do the same with 
Okay, you know, and just like, like honestly, guys, when when Ben talks about the stuff, this this is why a training course like that is so good because you do not have to download the program if you're just starting out or you want to crush mid stakes. You do not have to put in all the stuff. You don't have to think about the ranges. It's all supplied. That's why it's so strong. It saves you so much fucking time. Yeah. And that's why it's also more on the expensive side because we have been putting a lot of time, effort, investigation in it and created all those ranges considering those equity realization factors, uh, not only for Hetsa but also for Multiway. And you're always going to be on the safe side. And you see even King Jack off if we think, okay, 50%. Um, it's also quite close. Uh, okay, with King Jack off, also our equity position might be then higher than 60% in a headset pot. So now in a multi weight pot, it might be 60%. But it's getting close. It's maybe a break even yeah. call, slightly plus. It's not the, this, this fifth point call. Um, so just that you guys keep that in mind, especially with those off suited King, off suited King X hands. Um, if you rather defend tight, that's always better. If you're not sure, just fold. There, th those are not the spots where you're going to print. There's an exception, of course, if one of these players is a big fun player. Then we could justify making slightly minus EV preflop calls simply because we're going to make up post flop for it. Yeah. Is it suited? Uh, you would agree if we say it would be better to jam first uh, up front instead of race folding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, eights. Yeah. So, would you go any looser than eights? Um, sevens probably, but that's about it, I think. Yeah. It's. I, I think that one of my one of my biggest weaknesses is is shoving ranges versus early position opens and calling ranges when I open myself and fourteen, fifteen big lines that yeah. shove on me. It's indeed tricky um because it really depends on the open raisers uh raising range and how he constructs his range there are people that are extremely strong when they do that there are people that are extremely weak um and that's that's the problem you you can't solve the spot really good just because it depends on so many factors but i think i would go with the eight bottom range because we have we have a decent stack like we were going to find some better spots so if I'm not sure, I just toss sevens. Um, okay. And you're also jamming two, four, five people. And this is, even though he's opening relatively loose, um, from button, perfect. I even go looser than that, like fives, fours, sometimes even any pocket, uh, if the guy is too loose, because there are just two players left to act. But here in that position, there's a huge difference. But I think, yeah, it's like sevens, okay. I can't prove that here, there, but, uh, yeah. or here and right now, but um, eights would be my preferred bottom. Check nine off. Okay, I'm going to call that. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't work out so well. Next bullet. Oh shit, yeah, I was like, what? Yeah. You open ace, ace, are you opening any suited ace here? Um, I think I might, I, yes, yes. That's a bit too loose. Uh, Would you like suggest full ace, ace six and ace seven or something? Or? Uh, no, ace, actually with this deck size, this is much better. Ace six and ace two suited. Because now with this deck size, we just want to make good top pairs where we can get it again on the floor. And um, with a6, a7, a8 suited, it's much more likely you, you, you can make two different top pairs. Yeah, okay, yeah. an eight high top pair is less likely than an ace high top, but you still, like with ace twos, ace three, ace four, you were never going to make a top pair. And okay. the, the uh, straight equity or um, the implied odds you, you have through making the wheel straight is not really important here since we're so short. So, That's yeah. The same I, misconception as before with the queen eight and stuff. Yeah, I would. I would rather add like king queen off, which in some lineups might be reasonable to fold. But again, with this deck size, it's just much stronger. Like jack ten, or, um, yes, frequently ace ten off, and some of the combos like king nine suited. So I think thirteen percent is is very 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 reasonable. You don't need to like here. 
the moment you raise fold too much, it really costs you a lot of your win rate. That's also where people, um, what I've realized where that, um, how do you say it, it goes hand in hand where people have bad win rates and their uh, open raising frequency is just too wide from early mid position. And then they wonder, I actually feel comfortable playing post slop, but actually it's just, they raise folding too much and it costs you so much of your stack you constantly. I don't know how much is it? Like 15% of your stack. Yeah. Wow. What, what was, what had happened here? Yeah, ah, he's mint, mint three bets. Yeah. Like a true gangster. <laughs> well, okay. Turn. Yep. Unless you have a question about it. Otherwise I'm just, yeah. you're going to stop me, right? If you have a question. Yeah. So, okay. Three X we call. Yeah. Of course we defend tighter. Would be would you would you defend any off suited king against three X? No, I think that I fold like King five and lower. Okay. Um yeah, I would go with King five often better, but Okay. I think not a big difference. Um How deep is it? Would you have a betting range here on the flop? Um, sure. Yeah, I would bet a deuce. Um, any deuce. I think that most pocket pairs are shelf free. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that I, a hand like ace eight is kind of up in the air for me. Could go either way. Um, but then you kind of turn, you, you get it. I mean, there's going to be some slow play pairs in there too, right? But that's very little part of your range. But that's the kind of problem when you start thinking about like, what do you bet? And you start thinking about like value hands as opposed to bluffing hands. And all of a sudden it becomes yeah. a very, yeah. very small group of hands. Uh, that's the point. I think we should just not bet so much. I, it, it's a deuce, but are we having so many deuce eggs? We're not having king deuce. It's just the suited combos. So. Yes, we have some deuces, but I also don't mind checking back ace deuce. Um, so we bet our 9x and probably our strongest flush draws, not flush draws and king high flush draws and check back the weakest. Um, yeah. And maybe some polarized bets like jack 10 with jack and high, so jack 10 and clubs. Um, so we also have some bad folds. Otherwise, if we just bet the draws and 9x, we just have bad cards. Uh, actually, I wouldn't mind betting king eight with king and hearts. I think it's also a good combo. Um, yeah, see, that's the thing. If I if I had king king eight of of diamonds here, I probably would bet. But king eight with the hearts, I think again about the multi street playability. Yeah, but you want to have the multi street playability when you bet. Yeah, you really want to because then what what like how are you going to proceed on later streets if you have king eight and diamonds? You just bet once and give up. That's you, true. That's, that's, that's yeah. the point. You, you really want to have this playability, actually what you want to have in your checking range, in your betting range. You want to have this ec good good equity or relatively good equity against calling range in your betting range and not in your checking range. Um, so otherwise, what you would do is you invest in low equity situations instead of in good equity situations. I, I literally see it as stocks, like as retarded as it might sound, but, um, no, 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 I get it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's very, it's, yeah. I understand. It's just like making a pot bigger with the hand that has more equity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, other than that, pretty standard check down. Good for it. I think that's where a lot of people call and want to see a flop and um, yeah, we have to be very, very patient here in those spots, not try to chase weak suited connectors. Good open. Good forward. That's interesting. Consider jamming. Yeah, now I would. Yeah, <coughs> like 
based on what everything that you said and what you showed, like, now it would just jam it. Um, yeah, I think it's a spot where either ways, it's, again, you would jam it to four, six people if you neglect the button. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's also on, on tougher tables, the higher I, I play, I'm more inclined to jam. The lower I play, the more I'm inclined to raise because I feel like the, the spot we had earlier with pocket eights, I think there's something a lot of people still don't do. So if they're, let's say, cut off, hijack, they, it's of course not so often, but you see it more often. Also with a hand like ace, nine suited, players on higher stakes are more aware that, you know, we also have a raise folding range. I feel like also based on the feedback or on the insights I have seen in, in my coachings with, with low, lower stakes students is they're very, very afraid and they give you a lot of credit from open raising from another gun. So I feel like the we are we realize more equity on lower stakes with King Queen suited than we would do on higher stakes. I can't give a certain number where I'd say, yeah, if I play higher than $50 tournaments, let's say if I play a 1K 500, tournament I would definitely jam probably also in a $200 tournament and then $100 I'm looking at the lineup let's say and then everything lower if I play Sunday Storm I'm, I'm definitely raising if I play the big 22 I'm definitely raising if I play Sunday Marathon I'm probably also raising you know um, that's that's how I approach these spots where I'm not sure and at the end of the day it's like whatever like both lines are extremely profitable so okay what, what happens here? Uh, Betsy raises. Yeah, well, we jam. I actually also don't mind just calling um, simply because this min raise. See, really having king eight, king six, eight sixes are very, very unlikely. Uh, I also think that he's either on a, uh, on a whatever kind of draw. Um, especially, you know, oh, he's playing against legs and you want to be on stream. I don't know. I think. You know, yeah, you also have to take that into consideration. They want to make some yeah. some random plays on you. Uh, maybe I would just call and just let them hang himself. Like, I, I think draws would just check jam. Look, look at the stack size. So I'm not really afraid of, um, you know, that he's on a draw. Hence, yeah. I don't think we need to protect our hand. So I just call and, like, either he has king eight or I don't know what kind of miracle hand he can wake up with here, six eight off or whatever. It's gonna get in anyway, but I want to let him barrel off his queen jack off or ten nine off or whatever. Well, aces, yeah, I think. And fucking correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> ah, next bullet. Yeah. It was an expensive one, but it was worth it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah, pretty standard. Also pretty uh, standard. <laughs> Team Pro. Team Pro. <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is very, very interesting. I'm really curious about your thoughts on this spot. Uh um, I think that I shove a little bit too wide against cutoffs and I'm pretty decent shoving range against the button overall, but I really do like shoving in the spot. Yeah. But, yeah. No, go, go on. I was just, no, I really, no, I really, I really do like shoving in the spot. I do think that I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Let's see. I, I'm not entirely sure how many people are. Oh no, no, this is very, this is like a hundred spots of the money or something still. But I do think it's short stacks because there's, you know, a short stack. Oh no, wait, they both have 30 big lines. Yeah, no, I, I really like shoving here. Yeah. And this is a spot where the ace is very relevant because he's probably, well, he has 20 bigs, but very often players just jam their king jack and, and queen jack suited, which I think is fine. Like here with, with around 20 big blinds and less to just jam those strong hands, which is a profitable jam. Um, so his his opening range is very polarized, right? So either like aces, kings, queens, um, jacks, tens, 
And blocking aces, ace, king, ace, queen, which is a big part of his race calling range, is, is very, very important. Um, it's it's definitely borderline. Like suited aces because they have um, very, very good equity also against the calling range. A snap jam, also something like king jack suited, king queen off, queen jack suited. So ace four, I think in general I like it. It's but not because it it has such a great equity against um, villain's calling range. But just because I think people are still race folding too much. If we look at the raising range, and now we assume that it's 20 big blinds, I, I still feel like people are too often raising those off suited hands and still raising too many suited connectors. Um, and then jamming is literally printing money. Yeah. And I'm also a bit looser in these spots. Yeah. You see, you got punished for folding. <laughs> <laughs> i love that dude. yeah that's also that's whenever i would I, I used to you know give some coaching to viewers or something then i would just also like roll out the board and i'd be like ha <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, it's supposed to make fun the game as well right so no i i, I very i very much remember that uh, during that spot um where I, I thought to myself i've been uh over shoving a bit i think from the small blind so i think that was kind of an adjustment that i made right there okay um this is something where i just love to play around with holy Marisa's calculator and just based on my experience what i p expect people to jam and just to raise of course it's not going to be 100 percent accurate but it's better than nothing and then i just yeah. see what i can rejam uh, against those spot uh, uh positions and very often ace offsuit aces are a clear rejam against uh 15 to 20 big blind open raises thing is also the risk reward ratio is pretty decent like especially when we then talk about 16 17 18 bigs um everything more than 20 bigs if you think somebody's open raising too much and you want to exploit him you can go for a three bit forward fuck man it looks so strong especially when he is regular i wouldn't do it against a fun player um yeah, yeah, yeah. but against regulars when you're three bit there with 22 bigs 23 bags it looks really really strong and you just want to exploit him raising too much and he just has here too much garbage in his, in his range which he can't continue with and we give ourselves a really decent price oh <sighs> airlines no action oh what happened here standard forward for you uh yes okay yeah yeah for me too ace 10 suited uh still fold i think yeah. that if i'm cut off for button then i'm more likely to show yeah it's getting closer and certain situations this guy is opening around 16 70 percent it's definitely more profitable even though we jam into 15 uh 50 <laughs> to five people uh but yeah ace jack we of course jam it, it, you jam ace check off uh no so it's low ace queen off and eights plus yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah and then like i would say like nines here nines okay yeah yeah i would go with eights better than ace check but i always say in these short six spots if you're like one if you're one hand away from the optimum you're doing well it's yeah, not about yeah, playing yeah. perfect it's about short stack poker and this is something i've learned playing millions of sit and goes it's about making less mistakes than your opponents and your opponents are doing a shitload of mistakes yeah and, and i also think that like the, the kind of the grasping the concept of that equity and feature street playability that's the kind of stuff that plugs huge leaks these are just like minor adjustments you know yeah exactly eights yeah similar spot to earlier yeah it's kind of funny that's exactly the spot where yeah. you asked yeah, all right so jack not ah you... do you think nine is a uh, open here uh it's close very very depending on the table and yeah uh, for for the people that are viewing it i would always say in these spots really be honest to yourself and Look at button cutoff hijack have they been very active so far if you use huts use your stats if they're more on the active side button big blind cutoff are the most important 
positions here because those are the positions that are going to flat call the widest against us. Usually the button and the big blind, um, big blind we're going to play in position against, so it's button that we should worry the most about and then cut off and big blind. Uh, yeah. If they were very tight, I definitely open this hand. Also stack size, like hijack cannot really flat call. Anymore. Also if they have stack size where they can't flat call that much anymore, it makes also the race better. So let's say if they have around 18K, 20K, that's very, very important. So constructing your, of course, we, we have a certain range. We want to uh, open race and then we make minor adjustments based on the stack size. And it, I know it, it can be a pain in the ass because you constantly have to screen the table, but that's how it works. And at some point you just do it automatically. And yeah, you're not going to do it 100% of the time because sometimes you just forget it and you're a bit tired of the grind after 15 hours of grinding, but yeah. Um, that's interesting. You just jam or you call? No, uh, I, I, my default will be jamming here. Yeah. And what helped me a lot is at some, because especially I remember at a point in time in my career when I had a huge downswing sit and goes and I was just looking constantly into aces and kings and um, and then at some point not anymore. So I, t I told myself, I just regem what I would call against an all in any way. And then I don't yeah. need to, I don't need to worry about, oh my God, what, what is he doing it with? And I see that over and over again where people post hands like, oh my God, this looks so much like aces and kings. Like, Fuck it. If you, if, you, if you would call the all-in anyway, then go all-in by yourself because it's going to be set up then anyway. You would have lost the money if you went all, would have went all-in. But he, the thing is, you're going to lose even more money if he is doing some random things. If he yeah, raise like folds 9 it off here and then you start yeah. folding a hand or you just call and he realizes his equity. So and as you can see here, like 10 big blinds raise forward. I have seen people raise folding with 9, 8 big blinds and just... I would have called an all-in, then I go all-in by myself. Unless, of course, then the guy has been playing extremely tight and then suddenly he open raises with 11 big blinds from under the gun. Then I make adjustments, of course. If we have the read yeah. or information, but readless, I go all-in with the hand I would have called anyway, so. Cool. And I really like keeping things simple in poker and not overwhelming myself too much. That's an interesting read. That here, wait, wait, I raise is that big. Yeah. I would have perceived that extremely strong. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was it close to the bubble or why did you? Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Must be. Otherwise, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, I, guess, I think so. Ah, he limped. Okay. Bubble over, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Time to double up. Whoa! Yeah. Oh man! <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that, that flop. Is, yeah, that is that was a that was a nice one. That was a, definitely a team pro. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just fold there. I just don't. I think that people have been limping. A, there's a lot of tendencies where people have been limping a lot of strong pairs again. Um, <laughs> I think also because some regulars are constructing some limping ranges and I think that also some fun players see that and I think it's kind of making a comeback to limp a lot of strong hands. So I play pretty, pretty, a little bit conserv more conservative when there's limpers now. Yeah. Um, it's close, man. It's close. The thing is, he, the guy also, the limp before already, where you fold the king jack. So I'm a bit more inclined to just call because in multi-way pots where one player is all in, your equitization goes close to 100. But it's a, diff it's a different table, right? Ah, is it? Yeah. Ah, okay. Then never mind. 
Yeah. But I think it's it's very very close. I wouldn't mind if you if you just went for it and you just jam, isolate the button. I mean, you will be jamming queen ten suited, jack ten suited, king nine suited. Of course, king queen, king jack as well. I'm also gonna probably full hands out that beat me right from the limper. Like yeah. But I also don't mind the call. You just you need thirty one percent. Um. Nasty spot for sure. Check it, suit it. First in could be close, but I'm gonna get first in anyway. Is it a jab for you? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's close. I actually really don't mind the fold. I think it's slightly profitable. Mm, yeah, it's very close. I, I really don't mind the fold here. Um, and going with Ace Nine often better. It's not a that hundred percent shelving though. I think that it's just like right on the line. Yeah. Whereas I think that also like if you just you know if you just have uh, if it's right on the on the on the cutoff of what you shelved, then sometimes you're gonna fold it, sometimes you're gonna shelve yeah. it. You're gonna adjust within that one hand range sometimes. Yeah. I feel. And that's exactly the point what you mentioned earlier. We make it minor adjustments here, and it's not something where I invest hours of studying and not now finding out and breaking down whether it's a sign off and a or a side off if you plug it in and you look it up in holy versus calculator and any other short stick tool and it shows you yeah it's slightly profitable it's like whatever but knowing that a side off is the threshold that's that's key knowing that ace five off is a fold knowing that a six off is a fold knowing that we should start jamming a sign off that's all about and if you just jam a side off or not probably depends on on your mood and that's not something you should focus on. And uh, yes, yeah, speaking about learning efficiently and focusing on other sports where you can make huge improvement. That's yeah. an interesting defend. You like it? Yeah, I defend pretty wide against min raises from like cutoff and, and, and button and stuff and hijack. Um, yeah. I. I I used to defend insanely wide, but then, you know, I, saw, I talked to Matt Staples about it and he, he said, like, it's interesting because, you know, he was, he, he actually turned me on to, uh, to raise your head. So then he talked about that and defending ranges and like equity realization. But this is just kind of like, I don't know. Uh, and this is also just based on uh, like some of the PIO stuff that I did where it just says, even against early position ranges, like, okay, defend Jack who's offsuit. But that doesn't take into account that you're always going to just, yeah. be, you know, realizing um, your equity. Yeah, that's that's a great hand to defend with in any position against the min race. Like, yeah. it's button, it's button's range is wide enough. It performs better against another gun range than king five off. So, yeah. What's your plan yeah, really for here? Like... For the flop? Yeah, just always check raise the solo in pretty much. Yeah, me too. Great. Um, if if we, I mean, of course, it's not the nicest flop, but he has king, ace queen, ace jack, queen jack. We have there's already twenty k in the middle, and if he calls, we always have five out. So all in all, a very very profitable spot. I'm really happy that he's even putting in six k. I always even see that as a sign of weakness. I mean, if we have ace king, you know, I feel like people should make it smaller or even make it smaller in order to leech us in. And to induce yeah. something now, if we make it bigger, if he makes it bigger, I'm actually happy because now there's even more dead money in the middle, and I yeah, expect even more thing. pawns. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, he jams for almost twenty bigs. Do you think this is too light? I think I would fold. Yeah. I think that, I don't know, I feel like people kind of spaz a lot. Um, he's a fun player, I'm pretty sure. I feel um, like a fun, mm, sorry. I think that people kind of don't want decisions if they get ace eight, ace nine suited, ace seven suited here, they just kind of get it in, king jack. Yeah. I think I dominate a lot of hands uh, that he shows with. Okay. And uh, I honestly don't think that he's shoving like aces, kings, queens, jacks. jacks of course maybe. not. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, I 
mean, obviously there's going to be some ace king, ace queen, but I, I do think that they're not really thinking about protecting that range by putting ace king in there or something. So uh, I think that ace king goes more towards the like min race side of things. That's I my thought process. Yeah, I think I it's it's a spot where I would not say you're wrong or this is technically wrong or this is strategically wrong. What I can say is based on my experience, based on what I see, I feel like his range is heavily weighted towards jacks, tens, nines, eights, ace, ten, ace, jack, ace, queen, frequently ace, king. And we're just performing really, really bad against that range. Um, may, of course, some outliner says ace, five, suited are always possible. But especially fun players, 20 bigs, based on my experience, it's that they rather open race ace, ten. Especially a bit deeper in the tournament now in the money. That's where they also get a little bit scared. I'm more inclined to call it off in the early game, simply because there's nothing really at stake for them. Um, but yeah. here, it's really a pain in the ass to fold this end, but I, I probably would have folded it, yeah. Oh, super interesting, nice. Yeah. Uh... yeah, well, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's a proper jam, but I would have expected that to be in this raising range more often. Uh, yep, yeah. standard. Interesting. Do you consider betting? Yeah, I really do like I, I do like kind of betting here sometimes because, you know, if. I'd much rather check Queen X, but if I'm never betting anything here, how can I ever double barrel this down or something, you know? Like, I really feel like just betting here sometimes, he's still going to stick around with 9X, he's still going to stick around with some 10X, maybe some King X, you know? Like, I do yeah. feel like it kind of works for a bet, bet, and then check the side on the river. Yeah. Uh, I also expect him, like, since we... Let's say we are... Yeah, we have 30K behind... It's a very co coordinated board and we can just check jam and check raise so many hands. Mm -hmm. The way you can easily have queen eight, king queen. He's by the way an excellent sitting goal player, so he definitely knows what he's doing. Um so he will definitely have king queen, queen eight in his checking range. And also I think not only for this specific situation, based on the feeling what people sometimes have is that they kinda know they might not consciously know what they do, but they kinda know that we should start checking back because we are so short and there are more raises and they, you know, subconsciously start checking back more hands. Um, so I definitely expect a hand like King Queen, also something like Ace Queen with Ace and Diamonds more often in a check back range, or, um, Queen Eight. Um, so even King Ten easily possible. So I expect him Queen Nine to have more Queen X than as we as deep here. Like so deep, he can easily bet king queen, queen ten, call a raise, queen eight, especially if he has a backdoor flush draw. So, yeah, for that reason, I don't expect him having so many queen eggs. Hence, I really like the bet. Um, you can bet bigger, All right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, this is really is... a spot where I just think like if I can just bet forty eight hundred also with like, you know, a hand like I don't know four three suited or seven four suited or something, or some king eight, you know, king seven. If I can really pick this bet sizing, then I'm doing really well. Plus, I'm just gonna, also going to get called a lot more often. So I kind of felt that worked well from a big blind pers defending perspective. Yeah. Let me let me approach it from that perspective. We always want to have more value combos more value betting than bluff betting in most spots so you should always look at okay what are we going to do with our value bets yes of course you as you mentioned you benefit from betting small with your bluffs because you give yourself a great price but against a solid opponent he will also increase his calling range so you might give yourself a better price but you also increase his calling range um, but what happens and that is even worse for uv is you lose so much value against. He he will for sure call nine x. He will for sure call tens. And once in a while, he's also supposed to make a real call with sevens and eights because he has a shitload of ace highs and king highs. He's coming to the river with. Okay, not a shitload, yeah. but ace king, 
ace deuce, ace three, ace four, ace five, ace eight, ace ten. Um, all the all the nine x hands, pocket tens, pocket eights, and like seven eight k, seven k he will always call against. I mean, your Lex Feldhaus, he's he's not going to fold a nine against you. He's not going to fold a six yeah. against you. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I like it. I like your reasoning there. It's yeah. it's so much less important to because it's such a small part of a range that we get there with uh, bluffs. It's just more important to uh, or smaller part than I think it is. Yeah, and yeah. to be honest, like if you bet that small, like at least against me, I have seen like very ridiculous zero zero calls. I like it in certain spots. Uh, I mean, I definitely we definitely should like. Don't get me wrong. We should definitely have a small betting range here. Um, we can mix it make make it with a nine. Make it with ace nine, king nine, because then you really want to give him the right price to make a hero call with an ace, making hero call with uh, with ace six, right? Block yeah, bet with yeah. with say for whatever reason you have pocket tens. I like that. So you just like I, I'm looking at the betting range too much as a whole here. Yeah, where you, you can still construct it in two different ways. You can really fragmentate it into I have good hand, I bet big. My weaker value hands, I bet a bit smaller. Then you also put some of of, of good bluffs in your big betting range and some of weaker bluffs in your small betting range. Uh, big hands I would bluff big would be probably those hands where I'm not, let, okay, let, no, let's start with the small betting range because I think it's easier. The small betting range, what were we actually attacking? A size and king eyes, right? This is the huge benefit of making them for it. So everything like 10-7, um, uh, 10 do suited, um, those would be the, the hands, like premium premium hands to bluff with. Especially, yeah. let's say, 10 in diamonds, because he can once in a while have a hand like ace-10. So everything 10x in diamonds plus whatever. Um, these would be my hands I would bet bluff small with. If I have a king or ace, let's say king deuce with king in diamonds, I size it up a little bit, because now we block his snap folding range and it's more likely that he might have an ace high or even a pair. So now his, the range, but those are just, you know, subtleties, but that also helps you to in game to break down your own range and to, to know what you do. And in order to find out the, to deploy the right sizings, you want to do it based on blocker effects. What, and I also know that for many high stakes cash game players, what they also do is they simplify it. You can also just have bet half pot with your entire range. You're not going to lose so much value, but it makes things very easy. All right, guys, we're going to cut it off right there. Um, I understand that it's a lot to take in. Uh, I hope you found, found it very interesting. It definitely shows that there's multiple ways you can look at certain situations. And um, you can do a good thing, but sometimes there's an even better one. And it's really cool to me too, because after this, I really thought to myself, I want to start playing. I want to start practicing all the stuff that Ben has been saying or testing them out, you know, in the in the actual poker street. So I think that's one of the things that coaching can do for you. Um, you really want to start playing, especially when you're losing, especially when you're downswinging, getting that confirmation that you're learning, that you have new strategies, that'll really fire up that hunger to play. And otherwise, you're just sitting there and you think like, oh, we have to do this shit again. If you want to check out Raise Your Edge, check the link in the description. Um, it's honestly the best poker product that I've ever worked with. Uh, you don't have to do anything with tools. They're going to explain everything to you. And if you could use tools in the future, they're going to show you how to use it. And it's just easier to get better. So check out also the discount codes. You can get $80 off the Apprentice course with the codes Lex App. You can get um, $150 off the Expert course with Lex EXP. And the brand new Bounty course, uh, you can get $100 off as well if you lose, use Lex Bounty. Um, if you want to be serious about your game, you better start getting on this kind of stuff. If you also want to have a hobby and you want to lose less, get on that stuff as well. I use it all the time. There's more coaching videos with BenCB coming. Uh, drop a like if you want to see more of these coaching videos. Please do so, guys, because if you do not, then I know that you guys don't like it and I won't post stuff like this in the future. All good with me, but just know if you uh, just let me know if you like it um, and we'll see where we can go from there. Thank you for watching. Post in the comments what you think. Did you think it's interesting? Did you expect certain stuff to be a certain way? Um, I'll get back to your questions. Peace.